Chapter 1, Initiation June 15, 1975 I proudly strolled across the wax hardwood stage of the auditorium at the 54th Street Elementary School under the beaming stairs of my mother, aunt, and uncle Clarence. Taking my assigned place next to Joe Johnson as we had rehearsed for a week, I felt very different, older, more attached than any of my fellow classmates. This feeling made me stand more erect, made me seem more important than any of my peers on stage, even Joe Johnson, who was the king of the school. Looking back now, it's quite amusing to remember how proud I was and how superior I felt to Joe Johnson. I first sensed my radical departure from childhood when I was suspended a month before graduation, driven home by Mr. Smotherman, the principal, and not allowed to go on the grad class outing for flashing a gang sign on the school panorama picture. Mr. Smotherman was appalled and accused me of destroying a perfectly good picture, not to mention that I was starting to show signs of moral decay. Actually, half the things Mr. Smotherman told me I didn't catch because I wasn't listening, and besides, my mind had been made up weeks prior to my have gotten caught flashing the sign on the panorama picture. How I expected to get away with flashing on a photograph is beyond me. But, too, it points up my serious intent even then. For I was completely sold on becoming a gang member. As our graduation activities bore on, my disinterest and annoyance at its silliness escalated. I was eager to get home to the hood and to meet my moral obligation to my new set of friends who made Joe Johnson look weak. After the seemingly long year graduation, my mom, aunt, and uncle Clarence congratulated me with lunch at Bob's Big Boy. I was the second youngest in the family of six. Everyone's name began with a K. My brothers were Kevin, Kerwin, and Kershawn. The youngest, Kim, and Candice were my sisters. My father and I never got along and I couldn't understand why he mistreated me. While returning home, I sat transfixed to the side window, looking out into the streets, but not seeing anything in particular, just wishing my Uncle Clarence would drive faster. Tonight was to be my initiation night, and I didn't want to be late or miss out on any activities that might occur during my first night on duty. Bending the corner onto our block in my Uncle's Monte Carlo, I sunk down in the back seat to avoid being seen in my white knit suit and tie. Peeking to make sure the coast was clear, I bolted past mom's into the house, down the hall, and into my room for a quick change. What's your damn problem, boy? Bellowed mom's from the hallway. I don't know why you think you're going out anywhere until you have cleaned up that funky room, taken out this trash, and I never heard the rest. I was out the window and in the wind, steaming toward my destiny and the only thing in this life that has ever held my attention for any serious length of time, the streets. Stopping once I had gotten around the block to collect my coonies, I met up with Trey Ball, who had accepted my membership and agreed to sponsor me in. What's up, cuz? Trey Ball extends his very dark, muscular, veined hand. Ain't nothing, I responded, trying to hide my utter admiration for this cat, who is quickly becoming a ghetto star. A ghetto star is a neighborhood celebrity known for gangbanging, drug dealing, and so on. So what's up for tonight? Am I still in or what? Yeah, you on? As we walked to the shack in silence, I took full advantage of the stares we were getting from onlookers who couldn't seem to make the connection between me and Trey Ball, the neighborhood hoodlum. I took their looks as stares of recognition and respect. As the shack was actually a back house behind Trey Ball's house, I met Huckabuck, who was a dark, athletic, very physical, and an awesome fighter. He came to California from New York, accent included. For the most part, he was quiet. Leprechaun, who we called Lep, was there. I had known him prior to this as he went to school with my brother. Lep had a missing front tooth and a slight bill. Fiercely loyal to Trey Ball, Lep stood to be second in command. Then there was Fly, who dressed cool and with an air of style. Light complexion and handsome, he was a ladies man, not necessarily vicious, but was gaining a reputation by the company he kept. Next was GC, which stood for Gangster Cool. 
GC was possibly the most well-off member present, meaning he had things. Things our parents could not afford to give us. He gangbanged in Stacy Adams' shoes. What's your name, homeboy? Huckabuck asked from across the room through a cloud of marijuana smoke. Cody. My name is Cody. Cody? There's already somebody named Cody from the 90s. I already knew this from hearing his name. Yeah, but my real name is Cody. My mother named me that. Everyone looked at me hard and I squirmed under their stares, but I held my ground. To flinch now would possibly mean explosion. What? Huckabuck said with disbelief. Your mother named you Cody? Yeah, no shit, I replied. Righteous. Fuck it. Then we'll back you with it. But you gotta put work in. Put work in means a military mission. To hold it, cause that's a hell of a name. Fly piped up from his relaxed position in an armchair. I'm gonna put some work in tonight for the set. We know, Lap replied, we know. GC, who was dressed like a gas station attendant in blue khakis with a matching shirt, and I started out to steal a car. All eyes were on me tonight, but I felt no nervousness, and there was no hesitation in any of my actions. This was my passage of right to manhood, and I took each order as serious as any African would in any initiation ritual from childhood to manhood. GC was the expert car thief amongst the set. Gone in 60 seconds, could have been very well patterned after him. He had learned his technique from Marilyn, our older homegirl who always keeps at least two stolen cars on hand. Tonight, we were out to get an ordinary car, possibly a 65 Mustang or a 68 Cougar. These, I learned, could be hot wired from the engine with as little as clothes hangers touched on the alternator and then the battery. The only drawbacks here were the gas gauge, radio, and horn would not work and the car would only run until the alternator burned out. Nevertheless, we found a Mustang, blue and very sturdy. GC worked to get the hood up and I kept point with the 38 revolver. I was instructed to fire on any light in the house and anyone attempting to stop us from getting this car. I paced in a tight to and fro motion, watching closely for any sign of movement from either the house, the yard, or the shrubbery flanking the house. I was the perfect sentry, for had any movement occurred or any light flashed on, I would have emptied six rounds into the area, if not the person. Actually, I had only fired a real gun once, and that was into the air. Under the cloak of darkness, I heard GC grunt once and then lift the hood. It took him longer to unlatch the hood than to start the car. The engine turned once, then twice, and finally it caught and roared to life. It's on, GC said, with as much pride as any brand new father looking for the first time at his newborn child. We slapped hands in gesture of success and jumped in. Pulling out of the driveway, I noticed a light turn on in what I believed to be the kitchen. I reached for the door handle with every intent of shooting into the house, but GC grabbed my hand and said, don't sweat it, we got the car now. On the way back to the shack, I practiced my mad dog stares on the occupants of the cars besides us at stoplights. I guess I wasn't too convincing because on more than a few occasions I was laughed at, and I also got a couple of smiles in return. This was definitely an area to be worked on. At the shack, we smoked pot and drank beer and geared up for the mission, which still had not been disclosed to me. But I was confident in my ability to pull it off. I have never ever felt as secure as I did in the presence of these cats who were growing fonder of me, it seemed, with each successive level of drunkenness they reached. Cuz, you gonna be down? Watch, Let pronounced as if telling his son-in-law he would be a great lawyer. He stood over me and continued, I remember your little ass used to ride dirt bikes and skateboards, acting crazy and shit. Now you wanna be a gangster, huh? You wanna hang with real motherfuckers and tear shit up, huh? His tone was probing but approving. He was talking with heated passion and the power of a general father. Stand up, get your little ass up. How old is you now anyway? 11, but I'll be 12 in November. Damn, I never thought about being too young. At this time I stood up in the front of left and never saw the blow to my head from Huck. Bam, and I was on all fours struggling for equilibrium. Kicked in the stomach, I was on my back 
counting stars in the blackness. Grabbed by the collar, I was made to stand up again. A solid blow to my chest exploded pain in bold red letters on the blank screen that had now become my mind. Bam! Another. Then another. Blows rained in on me from every direction. I felt like a pinball. I knew now, if I went down again, I'd be kicked. And from the way that last kick felt, I was almost certain that GC had kicked me with his point at Stacey Adams. Up until this point, not a word had been spoken. I had heard about being corded in. Corded means to be accepted through a barrage of tests, usually physical. Though this can include shooting people or jumped in, but somehow in my still childish mind, I had envisioned it to be noble gathering, paperwork, and arguments about my worth and my ability in regard to valor. In the heat of desperation, I struck out, hitting Fly full in the chest, knocking him back. Then I just started swinging with no style or finesse, just anger and the instinct to survive. Of course, this did little to help my physical situation, but it showed the others that I had a will to live. And this in turn reflected my ability to represent the set in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The blow stopped abruptly and the sound of breathing filled the air.